from CBS News Bay Area. This is the Afternoon Edition. Right now on the Afternoon Edition, overdose deaths in San Francisco are seeing a significant spike. Now leaders are coming up with plans to combat the fentanyl crisis. Good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth Cook. And I'm Ryan Yamamoto. The month of May becoming one of the deadliest months on the fentanyl crisis since the city began recording in 2020. 74 people have died from accidental drug overdoses in the city with 79% of those deaths involving fentanyl. The new numbers were just released by the medical examiner's office yesterday. It brings the total deaths from accidental overdose to 346 this year. That's a 40% spike from last. And Governor Newsom and city leaders have been taking steps to combat the fentanyl crisis here in the city. Last month, the governor launched a partnership between the city, the CHP, and the California National Guard to try to dismantle fentanyl trafficking in the Tenderloin and key areas all around the city. And just this week, CHP seized enough fentanyl to kill 2.3 million people. In San Jose, a fire tore through this two-story house early this morning. It happened on Greystone Lane, just north of Camden Avenue. San Jose Fire says that they got the call around 2.45 this morning. They tweeted out this picture of the flames when they arrived on scene. Crews were able to get it under control about two hours later. Luckily, no injuries have been reported. And Liz, also in San Jose, police arresting one person in connection to Wednesday's storage facility fire. That fire triggered explosions and gutted much of the facility on Blossom Hill Road. Many customers lost everything that had been stored. The cause of that fire is still under investigation, but our cameras did spot what looked like fireworks all over the ground. And we checked, and explosives are on the list of items that public storage does not allow you to store. Now, in light of the uptick in gun violence and mass shootings in cities around the Bay Area and around the country, leaders in San Francisco held an event to raise awareness on gun violence protection. Representative Nancy Pelosi was one of the invited guests, and she voiced her support for the assault weapon ban and measures that will install background checks for people purchasing guns. That with all the respect for the fact that 87% of the people support our gun violence prevention me measures. It isn't reflected in the Congress. We must have a political solution. We must elect people who will help us. A ceasefire event is also expected to be held in Oakland today. Well, this comes after parents packed a San Jose Unified Board meeting last night. The focus was on how to keep campuses safe after multiple students were arrested for bringing guns to school over the past few months. Well, another flagship store is closing its doors for good in downtown San Francisco. The AT&T store on Powell Street will close on August 1st. The closure leaves the city with 11 remaining AT&T stores. We're told impacted employees will have opportunities elsewhere in the city. A warning for drivers in San Francisco. The southbound traffic lanes on the Great Highway between Slope Boulevard and Lincoln Way will be closed to vehicles as crews begin their annual sand relocation project at Ocean Beach. The goal is to reduce the amount of sand buildup along the Great Highway during windy weather. Public Works crews will be moving approximately 30,000 cubic yards of sand. The operation runs through the end of the month. Well, the Golden State Warriors have a new general manager of the team confirming in a tweet that Mike Dunleavy Jr. has been promoted to general manager. Dunleavy was serving as vice president for basketball operations for the team. He is replacing Bob Myers, who recently stepped down after leading the Warriors to four NBA championships. The Oakland A's have been in the Bay for the past 55 years, but now it looks like the team is about to get a one-way ticket to Vegas after Nevada Governor Joe Lombardo signed a bill securing $380 million in taxpayer money to build a new ballpark on the Strip. The team put out this statement saying they're excited about the Nevada sports scene and looking forward to becoming a valued community member. Meanwhile, Oakland Mayor Shang Tao insists the city went above and beyond to keep the team in Oakland. But the MLB commissioner himself says the city has only itself to blame. The A's will now need to file a new relocation application. A committee will iron out the details and make a recommendation that will eventually go to all MLB owners for a final vote. 
Well, today, San Francisco is officially kicking off Juneteenth weekend with a celebration at City Hall. This holiday is Monday and marks our country's second Independence Day. It was June 19, 1865, when hundreds of thousands of enslaved African Americans in Texas were notified that they were free by executive decree. In 2021, President Joe Biden signed legislation making Juneteenth a federal holiday. Now all around the country, Juneteenth is celebrated with festivals, parades and gatherings with family and friends. And our Justin Andrews met a South Bay artist whose artwork centers around the joy of black culture and community while not forgetting the enduring legacy of slavery. Every stroke of this paint pen is freedom for Rashid Lattimore. One of the things that I feel ultimately is freedom. He's a self-taught graffiti artist whose hands speak louder than his voice ever could. I feel like art is my voice. It's my uh, stamp on the world, you know? Um, and I always say that uh, the pharaohs didn't paint themselves on the walls. It was artists that did that. Artists like him painting with purpose, creating culture on a canvas. Since he was just 13 years old, Rashid has been making masterpieces, all inspired by his love for hip hop. If, if you saw my collection of work, you could, you could guess that I was a black person without me being there. He says graffiti art is a pillar of hip hop and a black art form. With at least a thousand pieces in his canvas catalog, each one pays homage to his black culture. Well, we're really right in front of my faves, so this is a piece called Clairvoyance, and it's a, it's like an Afrofuturism piece because it's a, clearly a black queen rising above the clouds and seeing clearly. He says the patterns, colors, and themes he uses honors blackness and the beauty of it. Art is always the constant for me, and it's, it allows me to have that freedom of expression. He says his freedom of expression comes only because of black people's freedom from slavery. June 19th, 1865, the day the news of the Emancipation Proclamation reached enslaved people in Galveston, Texas. But President Abraham Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863. It's called Juneteenth. Getting free from chattel slavery is, was the first step toward being able to create culture and to be able to be free in a, like a new way. Juneteenth marks our country's second Independence Day and is the longest running holiday in black communities. I just finished up the details here and this is my breakthrough piece. I was like, I started doing characters that were breaking through the canvas. A concept he wanted to explore, reflective of how black people in the 1860s and even today have broken barriers. The historical legacy of Juneteenth shows us the value of never giving up hope. A person like me has the, the ability, the freedom, and the luxury to be able to create something. And his art embodies and preserves the richness of African American culture and history. And you can check out Rashid's artwork and even his new book at the 42nd annual Juneteenth Homecoming Celebration this Saturday at noon in San Jose.